Revolution at Point Zero by Sylvia Federici. Part 2, Section 2. War, Globalization, and Reproduction from 2000. First came the foreign bankers, eager to lend at extortionate rates, then the financial controllers, to see that the interest was paid, then the thousands of foreign advisors taking their cut. Finally, when the country was bankrupt and helpless, it was time for the foreign troops to rescue the ruler from his rebellious people. One last gulp and the country had gone. By Thomas Pakenham, from The Scramble for Africa. You who hunger, who shall feed you? Come to us, we too are starving. Only hungry ones can feed you. Bertolt Brecht, All or Nothing. As the proliferation of conflicts in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East and the zest of the United States for military intervention through the 1980s and 1990s demonstrate, war is on the global agenda. This is because the new phase of capitalist expansionism that we are witnessing requires the destruction of any economic activity not subordinated to the logic of accumulation, and this is necessarily a violent process. Corporate capital cannot extend its reach over the planet's resources, from the seas to the forests to people's labor to our very genetic pools, without generating an intense resistance worldwide. Moreover, it is in the nature of the present capitalist crisis that no mediation is possible and development planning in the so-called third world gives way to war that the connection between integration in the global economy and warfare is not usually recognized is due to the fact that globalization today, while in essence continuing the 19th century imperial project, presents itself primarily as an economic program. Its first and most visible weapons are structural adjustment programs, trade liberalization, privatizations, intellectual property rights. All these policies are responsible for an immense transfer of wealth from the colonies to the metropoles, but they do not require territorial conquest and thus are assumed to work by purely peaceful means. Military intervention, too, is taking new forms, often appearing under the guise of benevolent initiatives such as food aid and humanitarian relief or, in Latin America, the war against drugs. A further reason why the marriage between war and globalization, the form that imperialism takes today, is not more evident is that most of the new globalization wars have been fought on the African continent, whose current history is systematically distorted by the media, which blame every crisis in it on the Africans' alleged backwardness, tribalism, and incapacity to achieve democratic institutions. Africa, War, and Structural Adjustment In reality, the situation in Africa shows the tight connection between the implementation of the Structural Adjustment Programs, SAPs, introduced in the 1980s by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, to facilitate the advance of multinational capital in the region and the development of a state of constant warfare. It shows that structural adjustment generates war and war, in turn, completes the work of structural adjustment, as it makes the affected countries dependent on international capital and the powers that represent it, beginning with the United States, the European Union, and the United Nations. In other words, to paraphrase Clausewitz, structural adjustment is war by other means. There are many ways in which structural adjustment promotes war. This type of program was imposed by the World Bank and the IMF on most African countries starting in the early 1980s. Allegedly to spur economic recovery and help the African governments pay for the debts that they had contracted during the previous decade in order to finance development projects. Among the reforms it prescribes are land privatization, starting with the abolition of communal land tenure, trade liberalization, 
the elimination of tariffs on imported goods, the deregulation of currency transactions, the downsizing of the public sector, the defunding of social services, and a system of controls that effectively transfers economic planning from the African governments to the World Bank and non-governmental organizations, NGOs. This economic restructuring was presumably meant to boost productivity, eliminate inefficiency, and increase Africa's competitive edge on the global market. But the opposite has occurred. More than a decade after its adoption, local economies have collapsed, foreign investment has not materialized, and the only productive activities in place in most African countries are once again, as in the colonial period, mineral extraction and export-oriented agriculture that contribute to the gluts in the global market while Africans do not have enough food to eat. In this context of generalized economic bankruptcy, violent rivalries have exploded everywhere among different factions of the African ruling class, who, unable to enrich themselves through the exploitation of labor, are now fighting for access to state power as the key condition for the accumulation of wealth. State power, in fact, is the key to the appropriation and sale on the international market of either the national assets and resources, land, gold, diamonds, oil, timber, or the assets possessed by rival or weaker groups. Thus, war has become the necessary underbelly of a new mercantile economy, or according to some, an economy of plunder. Thriving with the complicity of foreign companies and international agencies who, for all their complaints about corruption, benefit from it. The World Bank's insistence that everything be privatized has weakened the state, as in the case of Russia, and exaggerated this process. In the same way, the deregulation of banking activities and currency transactions, also demanded by the World Bank, has helped the spread of the drug trade that since the 1980s has been playing a major role in Africa's political economy, contributing to the formation of private armies. A further source of warfare in Africa has been the brutal impoverishment into which structural adjustment has plunged the majority of the population. While intensifying social protest, this, over the years, has torn the social fabric of many countries in the region as millions of people have been forced to leave their villages and go abroad in search of new sources of livelihood and the struggle for survival has laid the groundwork for the manipulation of local antagonisms and the recruitment of the unemployed, particularly the youth, by warring parties. Many tribal and religious conflicts in Africa, no less than the ethnic conflicts in Yugoslavia, have been rooted in these processes. From the mass expulsions of immigrants and religious riots in Nigeria in the early and mid-1980s to the clan wars in Somalia in the early 1990s to the bloody wars between the state and the fundamentalists in Algeria in the background of most contemporary African conflicts, there have been the World Bank's and the IMF's conditionalities that have wrecked people's lives and undermined the conditions for social solidarity. There is no doubt, for instance, that the youths who have been fighting the numerous African wars of recent years are the same who two decades ago could have been in school and could have hoped to make a living through trade or a job in the public sector, and could have looked at the future with the hope of being able to contribute to their family's well-being. Similarly, the appearance of child soldiers in the 1980s and 1990s would never have been possible if, in many countries, the extended family had not been undermined by financial hardships and millions of children were not without a place to go except for the street and had someone to provide for their needs. 
War has not only been a consequence of economic change, it has also been a means to produce it. Two objectives stand out when we consider the prevailing patterns of war in Africa and the way in which warfare intersects with globalization. First, war forces people off the land, i.e., it separates the producers from the means of production, a condition for the expansion of the global labor market. War also reclaims the land for capitalist use, boosting the production of cash crops and export-oriented agriculture. Particularly in Africa, where communal land tenure is still widespread, this has been a major goal of the World Bank, whose raison d'etre as an institution has been the capitalization of agriculture. Thus, it is hard today to see millions of refugees or famine victims fleeing their localities without thinking of the satisfaction this must bring to World Bank officers as well as agribusiness companies who surely see the hand of progress working through it. War also undermines people's opposition to market reforms by reshaping the territory and disrupting the social networks that provide the basis for resistance. Significant here is the correlation, frequent in contemporary Africa, between anti-IMF protest and social conflict. This is most visible, perhaps, in Algeria, where the rise of anti-government Islamic fundamentalism dates from the anti-IMF uprising of 1988, when thousands of young people took over the streets of the capital for several days in the most intense and widespread protests since the heyday of the anti-colonial struggle. External intervention, often seizing upon local struggles and turning them into global conflicts, has played a major role in this context. This can be seen even in the case of the military interventions by the United States that are usually read through the prism of geopolitics and the Cold War, like the support given by the Reagan administration to the governments of Sudan and Somalia and to the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, UNITA. Both in the Sudan and Somalia, SAPs were underway since the early 1980s when both countries were among the major recipients of U.S. military aid. In the Sudan, U.S. military assistance strengthened the Neymeri regime's hand against the coalition of forces that were opposing the cuts demanded by the IMF, even though, in the end, it could not stem the uprising that in 1985 was to dispose him. In Somalia, U.S. military aid helped Siad Barre's attack on the ISACs, an episode in the ongoing war waged by national and international agencies over the last decade against Africa's pastoralist groups. In Angola, too, U.S. military aid to UNITA served to force the government not just to renounce socialism and the help of Cuban troops, but to negotiate with the IMF, and it undoubtedly strengthened the bargaining power of the oil companies operating in the country. Food Aid as Stealth Warfare In many cases, what arms could not accomplish was achieved through food aid, provided by the United States, the United Nations, and various NGOs to the refugees and the victims of the famines that the wars had produced, often delivered to both sides of the conflict, as in the Sudan, Ethiopia, and Angola, food aid has become a major component of the contemporary neo-colonial war machine and the war economy generated by it. First, it has entitled international organizations other than the Red Cross to claim the right to intervene in areas of conflict in the name of providing relief. In 1988, the United Nations passed a resolution asserting the right of donors to deliver aid. It is on this basis that the U.S.-U.N. military intervention in Somalia in 1992 through 1993, Operation Restore Hope, was justified.
but even when it is not accompanied by troops, the delivery of food aid in conflict situations is always a form of political and military intervention, as it prolongs the war by feeding the contending armies, often more than the civilian population. It shapes military strategy and helps the stronger party, the one best equipped to take advantage of food distributions, to win. This is exactly what took place in the Sudan and Ethiopia in the 1980s, where, providing food aid, the United States, the United Nations, and NGOs like CARE became major protagonists in the wars fought in these countries. In addition, food aid contributes to the displacement and the relocation of rural communities by setting up feeding centers organized around the needs of the NGOs. It also undermines local agriculture by causing the prices of locally marketed produce to collapse, and it introduces a new source of warfare for the prospect of appropriating large food supplies and selling them locally or on the international market provides a new motive for conflict, creating a war economy, especially in countries that have been radically impoverished. So questionable has food assistance been in its effects, so dubious its ability to guarantee people's livelihood, which would have been better served by the distribution of agricultural tools and seeds, and above all by the end of hostilities, that one has to ask whether the true purpose of this initiative was not the phasing out of subsistence farming and the creation of a long-term dependence on imported food, both being centerpieces of World Bank reform and conditions for the integration of African countries into the global economy. This question is all the more legitimate considering that the negative effects of food aid have been well known since the 1960s, when it became the object of much protest and research throughout the formal colonial world. Since then, it has been almost an axiom that you don't help people by giving them food, but by giving them the tools to feed themselves, and that even under famine conditions, what people need most to survive is to preserve their ability to farm. How the United Nations and the World Bank could have forgotten this lesson is indeed unexplainable, unless we presume that the appearance of food aid is contemporary war-related operations in Africa has had as one of its major objectives the commercialization of land and agriculture and the takeover of the African food markets by international agribusiness. It must be added that relief operations relying on the intervention of foreign NGOs and aid organizations have further marginalized the victims of conflicts and famines, who have been denied the right to control the relief activities while being portrayed all along in the international media by the same NGOs as helpless beings unable to care for themselves. Indeed, as Joanna McRae and Anthony Zui point out, the only right that has been recognized has been the right of donors to deliver assistance, which, as we have seen, has been used in Somalia in 1992 through 1993 to call for military intervention. Mozambique, a paradigm case of contemporary war. How war first and then humanitarian relief can be used to recolonize a country, bring it to the market, and break its resistance to economic and political dependence is best seen in the case of Mozambique. Indeed, the war that Renamo, Mozambique National Resistance, a proxy of apartheid South Africa and the United States, waged against this country for almost a decade, from 1981 to 1990, contains all the key elements of today's new globalization wars. The destruction of the country's physical and social reproductive infrastructure to provoke a reproduction crisis and enforce economic and political subordination. 
This Renamo achieved through a the use of systemic terror against the population, massacres, enslavement, the infliction of horrendous mutilations to force people off their land and turn them into refugees. More than one million people were killed in this war. B. The demolition of roads, bridges, hospitals, schools, and above all, the destruction of all agricultural activities and assets, the basic means of subsistence for a population of farmers. The case of Mozambique shows the strategic significance of low-intensity warfare, beginning with the use of land mines, making it impossible for people to farm, and thereby creating a famine situation requiring external help. The use of food aid delivered to displaced people and victims of famine to ensure compliance with economic conditionalities create long-term food dependency and undermine a country's ability to control its economic and political future. It must not be forgotten that food aid is a great boost to U.S. agribusiness, which profits from it twice— first by being relieved of its huge surpluses and later by cashing in on the aided country's dependence on imported food. The transfer of decision-making from the state to international organizations and NGOs. So thorough was the attack on Mozambican sovereignty that once it was forced to ask for aid, Mozambique had to accept that the NGOs be given the green light in the management of relief operations, including the right to enter any part of its territory and distribute food directly to the population at places of their choice. As Joseph Hanlon has shown in Mozambique, Who Calls the Shots?, the government was hard put to protest the NGO's politics, even in the case of right-wing NGOs like World Vision that used the relief distributions for political and religious propaganda, or NGOs like CARE that were suspected of collaborating with the CIA. The imposition of impossible peace conditions like reconciliation and power sharing with Renamo, the Mozambican government's and population's greatest enemy, responsible for many atrocities in the massacre of more than a million people, which have created the potential for permanent destabilization, this reconciliation policy, now cynically and widely imposed from Haiti to South Africa as a peace condition, is the political equivalent of the practice of feeding both parties in a conflict context, and is one of the most telling expressions of the present recolonization drive, for it proclaims that people in the third world should never have the right to have peace and protect themselves from proven enemies. It also proclaims that not every country has the same rights, since the United States or any country of the EU would never dream of accepting such a foul proposition. Conclusion From Africa to Yugoslavia and beyond The case of Mozambique is not unique. Not only are most African countries practically run by U.S.-supported agencies and NGOs, the sequence, destruction of infrastructure, imposition of market reforms, forced reconciliation with murderous, irreconcilable enemies, destabilization, is found in different degrees and combinations everywhere in Africa today to such a point that several countries, like Angola and Sudan, are in a state of permanent emergency where their viability as political entities is now in question. It is through this combination of financial and military warfare that the African people's resistance against globalization has so far been held in check, in the same way as it has in Central America. El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Panama, where throughout the 1980s, open U.S. military intervention has been the rule. The difference is that, in Africa, the right of the United States, the United Nations, to send troops has generally been justified in the name of peacekeeping, peacemaking, and humanitarian intervention— 
possibly because under any other condition, a landing of the Marines, of the type we have seen in Panama and Granada, would not have been internationally accepted. These interventions, however, are the new faces of colonialism, and not in Africa alone. This is a colonialism that aims at controlling policies and resources rather than gaining territorial possession. In political terms, it is a philanthropic, humanitarian, footloose colonialism that aims at governance rather than government, for the latter involves a commitment to a specific institutional and economic setup, whereas modern-day free enterprise imperialism wants to maintain its freedom to always choose the institutional setup, the economic forms, and the locations best suited to its needs. However, as in the colonialism of old, soldiers and merchants are not far apart, as the marriage of food aid distributions and military intervention today demonstrates. What is the significance of this scenario for the anti-war movement? First, we can expect the situation that has developed in post-adjustment Africa with its mixture of economic and military warfare and the sequencing of structural adjustment conflict intervention to be reproduced over and over again in the coming years throughout the planet. We can also expect to see more wars develop in the former socialist countries for the institutions and forces that are pushing the globalization process find state-owned industry and other remnants of socialism as much of an obstacle to free enterprise as African communalism. In this sense, NATO's war against Yugoslavia is likely to be the first example, after that of Bosnia, of what is to come, as the end of state socialism is being replaced by liberalization and the free market, and NATO's advance on the East provides the security framework for the region. So close is the relation between NATO's humanitarian intervention in Yugoslavia and humanitarian intervention in Africa that relief workers, the ground troops of the contemporary war machine, were brought from Africa to Kosovo, where they have had the opportunity to assess the relative value of African and European lives in the eyes of international organizations, measured by the quality and quantity of the resources provided to the refugees. We can also see that the situation we confront is very different from the imperialism of the late 19th and early 20th century, for the imperialist powers of those days were tied to and responsible for territorially defined social, political, and infrastructural arrangements. Thus, in the imperialist era of the gunboat and the machine gun, which could kill thousands of people from afar, responsibility for massacres, famines, and other forms of mass murder could always be identified. We know, for instance, that it was King Leopold of Belgium who had a personal responsibility for the killing of millions of people in the Congo. By contrast, today millions of Africans are dying every year because of the consequences of structural adjustment, but no one is held responsible for it. On the contrary, the social causes of death in Africa are increasingly becoming as invisible as the invisible hand of the capitalist market. Finally, we have to realize that we cannot mobilize against the bombings alone, nor demand that bombings stop and call that peace. We know from the post-war scenario in Iraq that the destruction of a country's infrastructure produces more deaths than the bombs themselves. What we need to learn is that death, hunger, disease, and destruction are currently a daily reality for most people across the planet. More than that, structural adjustment, the most universal program in the world today, the one that, in all its forms, including the African Growth and Opportunity Act, represents the contemporary face of capitalism and colonialism is war.
Thus, the program of the anti-war movement must include the elimination of structural adjustment in all of its many forms and, most crucially, the construction of a world no longer built upon the logic of capitalist accumulation if war and the imperialistic project it embodies are to come to an end.